Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Crispin Marathi and I am the director of the Pangea Wire Group. And in today's lecture, we're going to be diving into the perhaps esoteric world of cyberspace, outer space, and how sovereignty interplays between these two phenomena. Now to some, this is probably a brand new topic to you and uh, it's probably is the case for many people as well. So don't be shy if you don't really know too much about it. So we're going to jump into it because I believe it is vital for for as a general population, also for policy um, heads and policy wonks and also legal wonks to really understand why the concept of sovereignty matters so much in the domain of outer space and also in the domain of cyber. So since this is a talk related to technology, let's get technological. So I want you to guys to take out your phone, open up the camera app and scan this QR code. It's either gonna appear here, here, up or down, wherever it is. It's a blue QR code. All you need to is open up your camera and place it, scan it, click the button, and you'll be able to connect to my LinkedIn page where we can continue the conversation over these topics at a later stage. All right, so you can pause the video and do that. And uh, let's move on. Now to really understand the concept of sovereignty, we need to really understand in its classical form what it actually means. And what are the criteria that, makes, that can make a nation sovereign? And in this case, we go and we see that there are four primarily four characteristics that make up a state or make up what is considered a sovereign state. Firstly, you need to have a permanent population. You also need to have a defined territory, a place where you can stick your flag and say, this is mine. You also need a government to rule over, uh, to enact the laws of the state. Also, you need to have the capacity to enter into relations with other states. These are the four main characteristics of what we understand as classical sovereignty. But as we'll, as we'll see, this classical example perhaps is a bygone example, but it really forms a legal basis of where states interact with each other and the development of the state and international infrastructure. And as we'll see, as nations develop, as their importance grows, they are able to also enact sovereignty in other ways. Extra, so the term of extraterritoriality comes into play here. And in the case of the United States, this is very important because with certain acts, and not only the United States, but other nations also can do this, but we'll use the U.S. as an example. They've enacted laws and policies, well, laws really, that allow them to have jurisdiction over even non-U.S. citizens and non-U.S. entities, whether they're charities or companies or, or anything in between, uh, attributed to them, have jurisdiction over them if they meet certain criteria. So we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which allow for this. We have the Anti-Money Laundering Act. We have the Patriot Act to an extent. We also have um, OFAC, which is the sanctioning body of the United States. And within these, we'll see that if a, a non-US uh, person or entity behaves in, a, in, a, in, in an illegal way, they are able to have jurisdiction if they match certain criteria or if they are connected in certain ways. And these ways include that if they have a U.S. bank account, if they have a correspondent bank account, if they use the U.S. dollar, if they uh, are registered with the I uh, IRS, if they are a non-U.S. person who has a position in a U.S. company, if they have U.S. offices also. These are just some of the ways in which a nation can be under the jurisdiction of the United States. How a person or entity of non-U.S. origin can be under the jurisdiction of the United States. And in terms of the legal cases, there are two perhaps very important legal cases that come to mind when speaking about this in practice. Now, the first one is the case of OFAC and CSE Global, which is a Singaporean company. And the case of this, uh, of this is that uh, CSE Global is a non-financial institution. Uh, and OFAC, actually for the first time ever, in a civil sentiment, they agreed to a $12 million sort of fine, I guess, of uh, CSE Global because they engaged in transactions with a sanctioned entity. Uh, that sanctioned entity was Iran, and uh, the only sort of nexus between uh, uh, that implied U.S. jurisdiction was that the, con that the transaction was conducted in U.S. dollars. Now, this is not a unique case, but this is a unique case because it is a non-financial institution which or entity which has been uh, fined by OFAC in this case. We also have the case of Lychee versus the Canadian Lebanese, uh, the Lebanese Canadian Bank in 2012. The OFAC and CSE was in 2017. This one is in 2012, 
where Lychee, the plaintiffs, uh, represented U.S. citizens, Canadian citizens, and Israeli citizens who all resided in Israel, who were either injured themselves or had friends or family members who were injured or died because of attacks uh, by Hezbollah, in a series of rocket attacks by Hezbollah. And the plaintiffs sued the Canadian uh, uh, Lebanese, or the Lebanese Canadian Bank, uh, LC, uh, LCB for, for short, um, which was actually headquartered in Beirut, not in the U.S., and the plaintiffs argued that LCB assisted Hezbollah in committing the rocket attacks by knowingly maintaining bank accounts for alleged Hezbollah affiliates, uh, charities, which in this case was the Shahid Foundation. And they argued that uh, these wire transfers, uh, which allegedly totaled several of millions of dollars, were conducted using LCB's correspondent bank account with American Express Bank in New York. Now, because of that mix, because of that tie, they argue this, and in the Court of Appeal, they actually won. So these are just two cases which show extraterritoriality by use by nations. So this classical idea of sovereignty has been broken down, and for the duration of this talk, it will be broken down even further. And we'll show how it has evolved over time, too. Now, the main crux of why sovereignty and the idea of sovereignty changes really relies on our understanding of technology. As technology evolves, so do does our understanding and our understanding of the ontology of, of sovereignty. And this has been um, said by E. H. Carr in 1946 and also Tilly in 1992, two academics who really speak about sovereignty and the evolution of sovereignty in these cases. I've also written extensively on this topic, which you'll be able to find in links which I'll provide perhaps if this is on YouTube below or where else uh, we put this. You'll be sure to add links where you can see how this applies in reality. And the way in which the way in which sovereignty really develops is, is is so forth. So we have here land, where in the beginning, sort of, 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 of I guess theoretically in the beginning of time, we had the ability to claim sovereignty over land. So if I was uh, if I was sort of an entity and you're an entity, we could put a line down the sand and say that's yours and that's mine theoretically. So that's how sovereignty was established. As we grew in our technological abilities. We were able to also extend sovereignty over the seas as we became seaborne and as we used the sea as part of our as part of sort of the second domain in terms of uh, of um, a nation's defense. So the first domain would be uh, sort of land. Second domain would be uh, the sea. As again we developed in our technology, as the Wright brothers invented the airplane, and as the airplane was used by military means, we were able to cast our sovereignty over the sky. So then we have airspace, we have land space, we have also the space of sovereignty over the sea. So the law of the sea was also invented because of that, and also the law of the skies and so forth. Now, as we extend this idea of the changing nature of technology and sovereignty, we then come to a another part which doesn't logically continue with the other three, where we have physical land, we have somewhat physical water which we can extend, and also over the skies, we can do. But in the case of outer space and also cyber, these are two aspects in which we need to perhaps theorize a different element of sovereignty. It doesn't really follow the same pattern, does it? Because physically there's nothing there in outer space. So can you really um, claim any legitimate claim of sovereignty in, in, uh, in outer space when there's physically nothing to hold on to, nothing to say this is yours, this is mine, given the classical way in which we thought about sovereignty? Also, in the case of cyberspace, you know, can we apply existing international laws to cyberspace? Are there any gray zones in which uh, the law doesn't apply, or which we find it difficult to apply? There is. So that, again, is, is something that we as policymakers, as legal professionals, as defense professionals, and even concerned citizens really need to be able to grapple with and understand. And in terms of, well, let's start off with outer space to begin with, because uh, it's, it's a good place. And I've spent many years dissecting sovereignty in outer space and getting my head around the concept is quite a difficult thing to do in the first place when you just think about it so it was it was, uh, it was something that i found very interesting and of course of seeing this i saw that internationally there have been many international treaties uh, signed by international players to really set the rules forth and what sovereignty or what really the rules of outer space are this began with uh, the Outer Space Treaty, colloquially named Outer Space Treaty in 1967, and also subsequent treaties afterwards, including the Rescue Agreement, the, the Liability Convention, I'm reading off a page here, uh, the Resignation Convention, also the Moon Treaty, the latest one in 1979, which was updated subsequently. But if you were to if really 
pin or sort of extract specific parts of these treaties and how they relate to sovereignty, there'd probably be one article uh, in these treaties that really relate, that really stand forth, uh, which has been the guiding light to understand sovereignty in outer space. And that is Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And word for word, uh, it says here in Article 2 that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject, I repeat, not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. So you can't use it to claim it as your own. You can't stick a flag on the moon, for example, and say, you know, we own the moon. That is not allowed under international law. And that's generally agreed upon. That was agreed upon during sort of the Cold War times when it was the Soviet Union versus the US. They wanted to really create the, the, the rules of engagement in outer space as outer space was seen as a theater, the fourth domain, if you will, of, of, of warfare and defense for these nations. Fast forward to today, we have the US position on outer space, which has really remained quite um, quite similar throughout other presidencies. Uh, and right now we have Donald Trump's outer uh, space space force, which is in the news quite often, is a buzzword, it's something which has been talked about quite often. And in, what, in, in the first speech of understanding the, uh, the, the, the space force, we have President Trump saying here, and we have quote, where he said, when it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space, we must have American dominance in space. Now this can be interpreted in many different ways and I think it really shows the intention of the United States to be a major player to defend space so that other nations cannot use it for their own military purposes. So sort of having America as the as the big brother type character which which will preserve outer space to be used for the commons, if you will. We have China's position outlined in um, the 2016 white paper, which really explained how China wants to be self-sufficient in terms of innovation and producing uh, technology in outer space uh, for the aerospace industry. But that's not to say that they don't have ambitions of their own to make sure that other nations don't get there first in terms of, Amer of dominance in outer space. We also have the Russian position, which has been held since the beginning by President Putin where he sort of categorically denounces or opposes the militarization of outer space. But he also has insisted, and I quote here, that at the same time, uh, the march of events requires greater attention to strengthening the orbital group and the space rocket and missile industry in general, speaking specifically here for Russia. So again, outer space is, a, a, is an area which can be used for many different purposes. So this is something that they kept in mind. And in terms of the sovereignty dilemma in, the, in, in outer space, there are three major arenas in outer space where the sovereignty dilemma really plays out. Firstly, it's a, a space security is one aspect of it. Space debris and space, situa and situa space situational awareness is the second one. And also asteroid mining, which is a very interesting concept which we'll get into, is also the third. So if you look at space sovereignty to begin with as a concept, what does that mean? Now, from my analysis, there are two major parts of space security which we're going to. Uh, firstly, it's sort of defined as the absence of elements of natural or human-made origin that represents unacceptable threats to space activities or space systems. So really, in plain language, this means making sure that us as, as humans don't disrupt the natural ecosystem which, which we have created in outer space for the use of peaceful purposes. So, for example, satellites and other technological equipment in space, which has aided us in GPS, which has aided us uh, to help fight climate change or for uh, weather satellites or um, for our global financial system and other aspects. So making sure that the essential space infrastructure, which has been which is used by everyone, isn't disrupted by state actors or non-state actors to disrupt this. So that is a concept of space security, keeping that safe and keeping that ecosystem alive and secure. For the use of everyone and the second aspect of that is the use and the safe use of space for military purposes now this is where it gets perhaps a little bit more sexy a little bit more interesting um, there are four pairs of diets or four pairs of ways in which we in the military field military field approach and interact with space right so we have ground to space uh, operations which include ASATs, which also include something called hypersonic weapons, 
which is exactly what they sound like, you know, weapons which go faster than the, than the speed of sound, which carry ICBMs. And here we include the Wu-14, the, 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 the Chinese innovation, also the avant-garde, which is the Russian innovation, which allows these, these crafts to go at roughly 20 to 27 uh, marks, so sort of 20, uh, 20, 20 to 20, 27 times faster than the speed of sound. Mark 25 to 27, they call it. We also have space-to-space -space capabilities, uh, for example, dual-use satellites, or any maneuverable space object. So this is sort of space-to-space -space, uh, interactions, right, with satellites in space. We also have ground-to-ground -ground, uh, operations or strategies which rely on outer space to conduct them, so the use of GPS satellites or the EU's Galileo project is another example of ground-to-ground -ground operations which rely on outer space for its, uh, for its operations. And also we have space to ground operations which in theory haven't really been used yet but have been theorized and one of the ways in which they've been theorized is the rods of god weapon system which were sort of created in theory by i think the reagan administration which allows sort of titanium rods over two uh two, two, two three meters tall thick wide which have a uh, have a notice period of 15 minutes from launch to impact which can cause enough damage that, as a nuclear weapon can cause but without the reverberations afterwards. This kind of comes off of the back of the lazy dog projectiles, which have been used, I think, during the Vietnam War. They weren't space projectiles, but they were also air projectiles that were used during that time. But that's something that you can research in your own time. As I mentioned before, we have, as a human race, have had an ability to see our connection with space growing in tandem with our peaceful uses of space and also with our sort of uh, military uses of, uh, of, of space in use so in terms of the industrial military complex. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. We can use space to better ourselves also as a dangerous weapon or arena for warfare too, which is why space security is a big factor in that. Space debris. Now this is something very visual. I like to show some visuals here which really will allow you to understand how this plays out. So on the left hand side of the screen, wherever the screen is, we have an image of Earth as we would see it normally. So picture of Earth floating there around our Earth. Um, we have nothing much around there, just sort of um, stars, right? And below that again, we have an image of Earth, sort of how, perhaps how you would draw it when you were a kid with the sun in the corner and a very clean looking uh, plane. But it's important to realize that this is not exactly what Earth actually looks like, and there's space debris. Now, space debris is made up of defunct satellites, pieces of satellites which have collided with with, with, with each other. It's sort of the graveyard of space. It's sort of, it's sort of, uh, sort of the, the 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 trash can of space. Sort of all the pieces of technology that are not working now, that are working, which have been broken up, which even nations have also exploded themselves, which make up the mass of space debris. There's a lot out there, and figures from the um, European Space Agency really show the extent of damage and the extent of space debris out there. So we have 34,000 objects which are sort of 10 centimeters or larger in outer space. We have 900,000 pieces of debris, pieces of debris which are between 1 to 10 centimeters, and also 128 million pieces of space debris between 1 millimeter to 1 centimeter. These are traveling at between speeds of 25,000 kilometers an hour to sort of a hundred, uh, sort of uh, 11,000 kilometers an hour at geostationary orbit. Now, the closer you are to Earth, the faster the rotation is, the further right you are, the slower it is. So that's how it works. So these objects are moving at as tremendous, tremendous speeds. And it only takes one piece of space debris to really hit something like the International Space Station to really cause, cause a lot of, a lot of damage, which would require an international response. And where the idea of sovereignty comes into this, is that if this were to happen to a, a state satellite by a piece of space, space debris by another nation, who really is responsible for that collision, if it, if it is important enough to bring uh, to the international court? So is it the country which first exploded perhaps a satellite, which then caused another piece of uh, a satellite hit another satellite? I mean, it's very complex. So this is where the idea of sovereignty and jurisdiction comes into it also. And if we just see for visuals what this actually looks like, let's take a look at the other picture here. It's actually fascinating to see. What we have in reality, all these white dots that you see aren't satellites. 
they are stars, but they're actually pieces of space debris which are out there in our solar system right now. Uh, as you can see, there's a specific ring, sort of that looks like the ring of Saturn going around the equator of the Earth. That's what's called geostationary orbit, which is about 35,000 uh, plus uh, kilometers away from Earth. And that's where, as you see, the majority of the space debris has been put out into, but there's clusters within uh, geo, as we call it, in low Earth orbit, which is, we can see the coating of Earth with sort of a white layer, which is all the debris around there too. Also, the picture below that, we can see what actually looks like with the satellites there in place. And we can see the skies are full of box satellites, different kinds of satellites, national satellites, you know, private company satellites, which are there for use for us day to day. That's how we use our phones, how we connect to the internet. That's how militaries connect to each other. That's how NGOs connect to each other. It's sort of there for our own good. But this is the ecosystem that we have and it's very fragile as it stands and as more nations start to put satellites up there, as more nations become active in space, we have over 60 nations right now active in space, as more private enterprises come into space, as it becomes cheaper also to put in satellites, this space ecosystem has the, uh, the risk of, of, uh, of imploding in itself and really causing some, some really, really big damage if we're not careful. So the maintenance of our space ecosystem is key. Space mining. We'll jump into that now too. Now, space mining is very interesting because we may hear about it in news reports now and then, but perhaps it isn't something that we have focused on too much. But what marks an important turn in understanding space mining was in November 2015. And that's when President Obama uh, signed in the Space Act of 2015, colloquially termed. Uh, now, this law uh, recognizes the right of U.S. citizens to actually own asteroid resources. They obtain and so so they own astro resources. They obtain and also encourages the commercial exploitation and utilization of resources from asteroids. Now, given the fact that technologically we may not be able to do that yet, this allows the legal foundation for this to actually happen in the future. And for some, this is a great thing. A great thing. We have um, Eric Anderson, the founder of Planetary Resources, exclaiming that this is the single greatest recognition of property rights in history. But on the side which is against this, we have those uh, Ram Jakor of McGill University who oppose this by saying this uh, law is directly opposed to the Outer Space Treaty and specifically Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And this is only America doing this. I, don't, I haven't heard of any other nation really proclaiming rights over asteroids or resources over asteroids. But this idea of resources is going to be very important uh, for our next slide. Uh, but in terms of space mining, this is it as well. And I have articles which I've written, which I'll connect uh, connect somewhere where you guys have a chance to read more about this too. Resources is a very important concept. Now, remember I said to you that Article 2 said that nations cannot have legal rights or claim of sovereignty over outer space and celestial bodies? Well, this has actually been challenged in the past. And we have the case of the Bogota Declaration of 1976, uh, which is a case in point. Now, the Bogota Declaration was made up of equatorial nations around the equator, including Brazil, Colombia, the Congo, Ecuador, Indonesia, Kenya, Uganda, and Zaire, who tried to claim that geostationary orbit, remember the, the white circle that we saw in the past couple of slides? That orbit um, is actually, because it's connected, it has a relation to Earth, we cannot consider that outer space. Now, if we want to see word for word what they say, we have this slide here. And they declare in their declaration that equatorial countries declare that geostationary orbit, which is like, as I said, 35 uh, plus kilometers away, is a physical fact linked to the reality of our planet because it, it, its existence depends exclusively on its relation to gravitational phenomenon generated by the Earth. And that is why it must not be considered part of outer space. Therefore, the segments of geostationary orbit are part of the territory over which equatorial uh, states exercise their national sovereignty. So this, in their, uh, in their sort of theory, allows you know, airspace to be extended up to geostationary orbit above their nations. So any activity that happens amongst them is under their, their sovereignty and under their control. 
which is an idea which has been promoted by them but as you can properly guess this isn't an idea that has was shared by the wider international community perhaps if more powerful nations were lying in the equator or have territory in the equator perhaps this would have come out in a different way but because they haven't you know we can't theorize much further than that but this is a really good aspect this is a really good case in point to see how the idea of sovereignty in outer space has been challenged and also the fact that the outer space treaty doesn't specifically categorize the function or the characteristics or the phenomenon of geo yeah geostationary orbit in the outer space treaty this perhaps gives a chance for these nations to come up and define it in the way that they believe it should be defined and this is the conclusion that they drew so that's outer space covered done it's a very interesting topic i think you'd agree and sort of the takeaways from that i guess it would be that one there are more nations operating in our space there are also private actors operating in our space much more now and it's also becoming a lot cheaper to operate in our space which will cause the legal conversations of sovereignty and ownership and jurisdiction to be in the forefront of policy makers minds as the years go by and as our technological abilities become a lot more improved and a lot more capable and scalable too but let's now jump into understanding cyber warfare and cyber security that's very important so when you think of of sovereignty in general there are two major ways in which a, a national actor can violate the role of sovereignty first would be invading its physical borders and secondly it would be to interfere or to usurp inherently governmental functions or as in the legal you know in the in legalese they call it their domain reserve their reserve domain over government functions whether that's the police force whether that's uh, the army whether that's um, administering elections or administering things like that, like this if you, if a nation were to usurp or to interfere this could be understood as a violation of sovereignty now this is this second part is very important when considering cyber security and cyber sovereignty as as we'll see and the first sort of instance of why this is important perhaps came in 2000 uh, 2007 to in 2008 with the hacks of the Estonian government and also of the Georgian government by Russian actors where they caused a lot of you know not temporary damage to these governments cyber wise and NATO because you know at that time Estonia was a NATO uh, ally a NATO, NATO member rather is a hey we need help we need you guys to come in and we need uh, we need to figure this out so as time passed um, NATO called on Professor Mike Schmidt and his colleagues to come up with an understanding of how we can apply existing international law to the cyber realm to cyberspace and they came up uh, with something called the Tallinn Manual, which took between 2009 and 2012 to create, to theorize. And this was predominantly made up of non-state uh, actors, perhaps only sort of NATO, NATO affiliates, who wanted to understand uh, how existing laws can operate in cyberspace. This was published in 2013. And then after again in 2017, a new rendition, which was Tallinn 2.0, was created. Now this was created... Um, this was created as an extension to Tallinn 1.0 by including uh, states also to interact and to help form the legal framework of understanding sovereignty. And specifically, it was created to address cyber operations that fall below the threshold of armed conflict. And uh, cyber operations in general to space law, which we mentioned uh, in the past, the laws of the sea and also telecommunications law in relation to cyber uh, operations. Its team, was made up, its team was made up of NATO uh, countries and also non-NATO countries, so more international groups, including um, representatives from China, from Belarus, from Thailand, from Japan, and others too. And as Mike Schmidt uh, points out, the most important aspect of the book is not where they agreed on the laws, but where they disagreed and how they disagreed and what they came up with in conclusion to their disagreements. But fundamentally, the Tallinn manuals, Tallinn 1.0 and 2.0, are really legal heavy so they are were created by legal advisors for legal advisors understand where nations stand in legal terms to outer space and one of the main things they wanted to figure out was does in the first place was does international law apply to cyberspace now what do you think if you were to pause this video think about it what would you say 
Well, it took the group in the first Talim manual sort of really 14 to 15 seconds, if I recall correctly, to actually come up with the answer. And they said that categorically, yes, it does. But it's not black and white. International law in terms of science space is not as easy as more established law and more established practices are, I guess. But in terms of international law, nothing's really too black and white anyway. Cybersecurity not being an exception at all. And there are all sort of gray zones in which nation states and, and national actors can operate in, which are advantageous to them. And there are different reasons as to why they would want to operate legally in these legal gray zones. You know? So the first one is that it makes it harder to criticize and condemn their actions if they act within their legal gray zones. And therefore, it's more difficult to bring to build a consensus uh, against their actions by uh, by international actors together if they operate in these gray zones because when when one party say they um, they overstep their boundaries here legally another party may say well no it's sort of not clear so we're not going to you know join you in the in the condemnation secondly it also becomes increasingly difficult to respond it complicates the response action because the responses that targeted states can take depend depend on the legal character of the action taken against them yeah so it's because the response that targeted states can take depend on the legal character of the action taken against them but if you don't have a legal black and white picture of what the state did it's hard to respond in kind to them and there's three main ways in in the process of responding to an attack uh, uh, that we need to jump into just so we understand it more clearly in terms of the sovereign the sovereignty dilemma in cyberspace firstly it's what are the conditions of response of a nation and uh, you have to have certain boxes ticked before you can respond and the first thing is to realize is that a condition for response is such that the incident against you i.e. the state needs to qualify as an armed attack before you have the right to engage in kinetic or in a cyber response so that's that's the box that, that legal box that needs to be ticked it needs to be defined as an armed attack and in terms of cyberspace the Talent 2.0 manual gives sort of eight characteristics of nations, uh, four nations, so that they can tick off whether this matches this criteria. And also any violation of international law, violation, clear violation of international law, opens the door for the use of countermeasures, which is again another legal phrase. Now, countermeasure is what? Countermeasure is defined as an act in international law that would be illegal, but for the fact that it is used uh, by the uh, by the offending state of the offensive state to bring them back into compliance right so it would be illegal but they're using it and it's legal for them to use it just so that they can bring the state which attacked them back into compliance with the law and within that they can't go gun ho and free to do what they want there are certain characteristics in which they need to match in order to use countermeasures they include the countermeasure need to be proportionate to the first attack. They also need to be temporary in nature. You can't have an attack which lasts forever or lasts continuously. They need to be as reversible as possible. And they also, funnily enough, they don't need to be in kind response. So, for example, if, if state A were to attack state B with a cyber attack, state B then wouldn't need to respond in kind with a, with a cyber attack or hack. They could respond in a kinetic way or in a different way, which is proportional to the first attack. And then again, what does proportionality mean? That again is a legal definition. That's where, again, in terms of countermeasures, is a gray zone there too. Now, if a nation can't pin a certain act with a specific breaking of a law, then what is left for them to use are retorsion methods against the state. Now, a, retor a retorsion in international law is an unfriendly act, but not an illegal act, which a state can use for any reason or no reason at all, it's within their prerogative to use retorsion whenever they see, whenever they feel it is necessary. And examples of retorsion would be things like the imposition of sanctions, also dispelling diplomats, which we saw happen actually after the um, after the Novichok attacks in the UK. The UK government expelled Russian diplomats, and also the US also expelled the Russian diplomats because legally they couldn't really find a connection between uh, between the Russian government and the act so the only real re the only real way that they could respond is by using retortion tactics so again it's very legal heavy in terms of the understanding sovereignty here so I hope you're keeping up now if you look at this graph 
this really gives you a visual representation of what you can actually do. So again, the two things that you need to keep in mind on the y-axis, you have from the most uncertain one at the bottom to the most certain 10. And there's two things that you need to have ticked appropriately in order to react. And that is attribution confidence and also legal breach confidence. So attribution confidence is who did it, who actually, what actor, state actor acted against you. You need to have that clear in law. Also, what law did they exactly break? You need to have that clear also. Was it an act of regression or was it anything below an act of regression? You need to really have that ticked in order to be able to use countermeasures. These need to be as high in confidence as possible, legally speaking. And depending on, on, on where you are on that, you can act appropriately in the other way. And we have the optimal response gauge here to show you what your, your, your equivalent response can be. So for example, if you are a six on the y-axis of the attribution and also on the legal breach, then you are allowed to use up to a six in terms of your countermeasure. If it falls below, let's say a two or a one, then retorsion would be the only real things you can use, legally speaking, against that actor. And states like Russia are very good at working in the gray zone uh, because they are able to act in a way which doesn't violate any uh, international law, at least agreed upon international law, and they can really have their agenda met and uh, act in that way. So, for example, we see the, uh, the situation in the Crimea where they annex Crimea. We have the little green men that moved, that moved in and caused chaos, but also there was a referendum that happened, which really, again, brings the question of, uh, of legality into it. You know, Russia engages in, um, is, is in what is called um, asymmetrical lawfare. I think that's something that uh, Professor Schmidt came up with, which is very interesting to see. So if we apply the same dynamic to the DNC and the RNC hacks, the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee hacks of 2015 and 16, where apparently Russian actors hacked into servers of uh, the DNC and RNC and then subsequently leaked emails from the DNC to WikiLeaks, that was seen by, by Professor Schmidt as, as a violation of sovereignty because they uh, they violated uh, they violated the principle of domain reserve of the state and also it was in violation of the prohibition of intervention because it manipulated in his mind the election process now this wasn't agreed upon by all legal theorists and certainly wasn't agreed upon concretely uh, by the US government which is why we didn't see at least in public any real uh, countermeasures acted against the Russian government. There was a lot of research done, a lot of investigations done, and, and sanctions were upon them, and retortion was the only thing that they could have used, really, because of that legal gray zone in that case. Now, finally, what we're going to get into is something which is very important to understand, too. This is not when two state players are interacting, but what happens when a non-state player, non-state actor is involved in, in, in cyber warfare, if you want to call it that. When are states responsible, fundamentally, for the acts of non-state actors in cyberspace? That's the main question that we are going to try to answer now. Now, again, unsurprisingly, this is a very grey area as well, because attribution is something in law which is defined, but actually pinning attribution on states is very difficult. Now, the legal standard of attribution is such that you can attribute an act to another state if it is reasonable to assume that the state ha is connected. Reasonable and connected are the two main words that jump out at me here. Now, connected can come in two ways. One way in which you can be connected is that a state must be able to instruct, have the capacity to instruct the group, or the state has what is called in legal terms, international law, must have effective control over the non-state actor. Now, effective control over the non-state actors, again, is very hazy legal, uh, legal gray zone because what does that actually mean? Is it the fact that you provide funding or material support, uh, an example of having effective control? But what if multiple states are providing funding and also uh, material support to that non-state actor? How do you attribute um, uh, sort of responsibility in that case to state actors? What if a state is providing sanctuary, which enables the non-state actor to operate? Is that effective control? How much, like, how confident are you in that, in that y-axis to that x-axis that we spoke about in attributing um, responsibility to that state for the actions of the non-state actor? This is the argument that the U.S. used against Afghanistan with the Taliban, 
where they said that because they believed, the U.S. believed that the Afghanistan had effective control over the Taliban because they provided sanctuary for them, therefore they were in part responsible for the actions of of the Taliban, and therefore they could be countermeasures could be used against Afghanistan as well. This was their argument in summary, but other nations didn't really agree with this assessment themselves. So again, a really gray zone in this case too. There's a lot more that we can speak about in terms of cybersecurity, but I think my time is up now. In terms of wrapping it up for cybersecurity, I think pretty much would be the same characteristics as the summary I gave for outer space. And that is that there are more nations which are able to use cyber, cyber, cyber as part of their, um, their strategy. Also, non-state actors have the ability, hacktivists as such, have the ability to use cyber for their own uh, reasons. And also it's becoming increasingly cheaper and easier and it's a knowledge-based attack. So if you have enough knowledge of how to do it, you know, you know, the barrier to entry in terms of cost isn't really there. All you really need is a computer with an internet connection to cause a lot of damage. So cyber attacks are happening on a daily basis, thousands of attacks a day in different parts of the world. It's only becoming a lot more apparent. And these laws are going to be brought much more into the forefront, outer space and also cyberspace, as these technologies continue to evolve and as nations interact in these fields moving forward. So we need a robust legal framework which has been developed and which will continue to be developed in time, also to encompass things like 5G technology and also the use of uh, social media and the effects that that has on sort of uh, elections, domain reserve as you mentioned, and in other aspects too. But I'll leave it here for now. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you can connect with me via LinkedIn or my personal website, which is klismamarati.com my uh, company website, which is panjiawar.com, or my email, company email at uh, info at too. Thank you, very, thank you very much for listening.